This is the third and final lecture for week four. Uh, we're discussing chapter four in the notes. Um, so in the last few lectures, we introduced the notion of radial quantization and also the operator product expansion. So this time, what I'd like to do is uh, say something about uh, what's called a conformal block. And this is all toward our eventual, eventual goal of uh, constraining the form of four-point functions in conformal field theory. So conformal blocks. So again, the goal here is to uh, use the OPE, to use the OPE that we introduced last time to constrain four-point functions. So for simplicity, let's just restrict to scalar operators. Let's take four identical scalars of dimension eta. I know I've been using capital delta up to now, but I want to uh, reserve delta for the, the operators that show up in the operator product, product expansion. So now I'm going to take these four operators, phi one of x, phi of x1, phi of x2, phi of x3, phi of x4, and compute their four-point function. And we saw last week uh, that this is fixed up to an arbitrary function of two cross ratios and some prefactor that was fixed on us by uh, conformal invariance. So there's a distance between the first two points to the two eta power. There's a distance between the second two points uh, to the two eta power. U and V are my cross ratios, and Xij is the shorthand for the distance between the points Xi and Xj. So now what I want to do is I want to take x1 close to x2 and x3 close to x4 and use this notion of an operator product expansion that we discussed last time. So we're going to pair off the operators in this particular way and use the OPE. So when I take phi of x1 close to phi of x2, I can write this as a sum over primaries. I'm going to have to include spin here, not just scalar operators, c delta i, and then a capital C delta i, x1 to partial y, phi delta i of y evaluated at y equals x2, where last time we discussed uh, what this uh, capital C x partial function was. And similarly, we can do the same thing for the second two points, x3 and x4. So let's write that out so it's all explicit. We have these uh, coefficients, this fancy function of a position and a partial derivative, phi of delta phi delta i at z now, where z is uh, is x4. So write these these things here. These are my OPE coefficients, as we discussed last time. They're also the three-point function coefficients uh, of phi phi with uh, my primary operator phi delta i, okay? So if I have all of that information, I have these operator product ex expansions explicitly. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these two expressions, I'm going to plug these into the four-point function and see what happens. So my four-point function again, it's phi of x1, phi of x2, phi of x3, phi of x4, and this must be a sum on delta i, c delta i squared, these capital C functions, x1, 2, partial y, c delta i, x3, 4, partial z, acting on the two-point function, phi delta i at y, phi delta i at z, where y equals x2 and z equals x4. Notice that, you know, naively it seems we have a double sum a sum over the operators in the operator product expansion of phi of x1, phi of x2, the operators in the expansion of phi x3, phi x4. But again, that two-point function, it's only non-zero uh, when the representation data of the operators in the expansion agree. So the, the double sum collapses to a single sum. I just have a single sum over the operators in this expansion. So let's, let's just write that down. The double sum collapses to a single sum because these two-point functions vanish unless the, unless the dimensions and, and representations of a uh, Lorentz group agree. So that's interesting, right? We, we have to pause and appreciate this, exp this expression that uh, you know, everything here is fixed by conformal invariance except for these coefficients here. So if we were to know these three-point functions, uh, the coefficients in these three-point functions, we, could be able, we would be able to reconstruct the four-point functions. And that's a very important notion in conformal field theory. So 
these lowercase c delta i's, they fix the four point function. The rest of it, this, this uh, huge uh, product of the capital C's, C delta I of X12 partial Y, C delta I X34 partial Z, acting on the two point function phi delta I Y, phi delta I Z, and then of course we should evaluate these at Y equals X2 and Z, Z equals X4. This is fixed by conformal invariance. And instead of writing this huge expression all the time, let, let's just let's just try to simplify our notation a little bit. Let's call this g delta i of cross ratios u and v over this uh, prefactor x12 that we had in the four point function, 2 eta x34 2 eta. And this object in the numerator, this g delta i of u and v, this is what we call the conformal block. Okay, that's what we were out to define in this lecture. That's what we were out to introduce and define. Okay, so that's fixed uh, by conformal invariance. What's not fixed are these little c's, the, the three-point function coefficients or the operator product expansion coefficients. Those aren't fixed, uh, but if you happen to know them, then you can reconstruct the full four-point function. In fact, you can reconstruct higher point functions as well, and instead of writing this all out uh, algebraically, maybe introducing some notion of like a Feynman diagram would be would be a little bit uh, more useful. So you know what we're doing in the four point function case, we can think about pictorially something like this. We have our points x1 and x2, which we're bringing close together, x3 and x4, which we're bringing close together. And our four point function, we can think about it as some sum over these saw sawhorse diagrams where we sum over all the intermediate channels, all the possible values of delta and i that can contribute uh, based on our knowledge of the three-point functions. If we want to think about higher point functions, well, we just have to dress this up a little bit more. Like if we want to do a five-point function, here's x1, x2, x3, x4, and x5. We just break this up sequentially. So we have a sum over this channel, delta and i, and then we can bring uh, you know, the operators in that intermediate channel close to x3, and uh, x4 and x5 together, and we can get a second sum over the operators in the second, over the second internal line. So this would be some double sum uh, over the two, over the operators in the two internal lines. And again, it's all fixed by three-point functions. So if you know the three-point functions, you can fix the five-point function, and you can fix the six-point function, and the seven-point function, and so on. So the data of the CFT is encoded in the operator spectrum, the set of allowed deltas and i's, along with these three point functions, these C delta I. That's an important statement, so let's write it down. A CFT is defined by its spectrum of primary operators. It's just some list of deltas and I, capital I's, Lorentz representations, along with the three point functions, which are the same as the OPE coefficients, provided the two point functions are normalized to one. We could call those CIJK. Okay, and if you have that data, you can can reconstruct any higher point function. You can reconstruct any correlation function. Okay, perhaps I should add some caveats about local versus non-local operators, but let's not go down that road. You can reconstruct all the local correlation functions from this data, from the operator spectrum and the OPE coefficients. And so for four point functions, and this is gonna be our starting point uh, next week for the bootstrap, for the four point function above, this arbitrary function g of uv, g, this g of two cross ratios, I can decompose this into conformal blocks where the coefficients are these three point functions or operator product expansion coefficients. Let's try to make this a little bit more concrete. I, I can give you an explicit form for these conformal blocks in, in the case of four dimensional uh, field theory. So let, let's do that on the next page. I, I won't derive this, but I think it's useful to to have in your mind that these are you know, explicit objects that you can work with and manipulate. They're not just, it's not just formal nonsense. So here I want to give you G delta I for four identical scalars in a, a four dimensional conformal field theory. So I can characterize I, the, the, the Lorentz index, just by a spin, a single number L. I believe you only get symmetric traceless representations in the, in the OPE expansion for these four identical scalars. So this, I, this object I can write as one over Z minus Z bar. Again, I'm not gonna derive this for you. Z to the delta plus one, K delta plus L Z, K delta minus L minus two Z bar minus uh, Z swapped with Z bar. And I have to unpack this expression. So K beta of Z, that's a hypergeometric function. 
2f1 of beta over 2, beta over 2, beta. And the z and z bars, those are cross ratios, but they're related to the u and v in a funny way. So u is z, z bar, and v is 1 minus z, 1 minus z bar. So in, in closing, what I'd like to do is explain to you what the ZZ bar coordinate system is a little bit more geometrically uh, to give you a little bit more intuition for, for what what frame this, these conformal blocks are written in. What we can do is we can let x1 uh, sit at the origin, we can let x3 uh, sit at a 1 on say the x-axis and everything else is 0. We'll send x4 off to infinity and then uh, by rotational invariance we'll arrange for x2 to be in the xy plane. We just rotate it so it's in the xy plane. So the setup is something like this. Here's x1, x4 we're sending off to infinity, here's x3, and x2 is sitting up here in the in the, in the xy plane. So now, so now let's see how that works with our original cross ratios u and v. So u was x12 squared, x34 squared, over x13 squared x24 squared. So in this coordinate system, having sent x4 off to infinity, uh, these pieces of the cross ratio will cancel. x13 squared in the denominator is just 1, and what's left here is just the norm of x2 squared. So v, similarly we can write this as x14 squared, x23 squared, x13 squared, x24 squared. So again, the uh, the four terms will, will, will cancel out. And what I'm left with is, uh, let's say, the x component of the x2 coordinate minus 1 squared plus the y component of the x2 coordinate squared. And so I can, I can think about z and z bar as being uh, complex coordinates for x2. And this I can just write then as z, z bar, and this guy I can write as just uh, 1 minus z, 1 minus z bar. Thinking about those z's again as complex coordinates. So z here would be x2, comma 1, plus i, x2, comma 2. Okay, that's about all I wanted to say. I'll, I'll leave you with an exercise. The exercise is to verify the first few terms of, uh, of g delta l for scalars for l equals 0 in a small x2 expansion. So we have an expansion for these uh, operator product expansion functions C, these capital C deltas. So given those, you know, multiply two together, expand it out, uh, see if you can recover this conformal block, at least the few, first few terms of it in this, in this expansion. All right, I'll leave you there, and next week we'll come back uh, with our final uh, week discussing conformal field theory before we dive into supersymmetry. Uh, next week we'll discuss the bootstrap and how to uh, constrain the form of four-point functions even further and moreover to constrain the space of conformal field theories more ambitiously. Okay, so see you next week. <laughs>